thank you for joining us for the 2020, uh, 2022 Brown Bag Lunch and Learn series. Um, we're so excited that y'all are here to join us today. And today, our presenters are actually on our committee that picks the topics um, for the Lunch and Learn series. So we're so glad to have Hannah here and to have Troy Perry um, here to introduce her. And just to remind everyone, um, the Lunch and Learn series is presented by our friends of Birmingham Botanical Gardens in partnership with City of Birmingham Stormwater Management, Jefferson County Commission, the City of Leeds, Alabama, the Stormwater Management Authority, Alabama Green Industry Training Center, Alabama Cooperative Extension, and the Jefferson County Department of Health. And without further ado, I'll have Troy introduce Hanna to you all. Well, hello, everybody. I hope everyone's doing well today. We appreciate you joining us today. We've got a really good presentation. I've uh, heard Hanna speak on numerous occasions, so we're really excited about it. Uh, I'm Troy Perry. I work for the City of Birmingham, the Stormwater Management Program and the Watershed Management Program. Uh, lately, we've seen a lot of rainfall, a lot of uh, issues with flooding and that sort of thing. Uh, that is a priority on the mayor's uh, list of things to do. It's become more of a, a frequent issue that we're dealing with with these, uh, these huge rain events. So hopefully everybody's being safe out there. Remember to turn around and don't drown. Uh, never drive through water that's probably more than a foot. If you can't see the bottom, you need to turn around and go in a different direction. That's a big issue that we're dealing with. But uh, right now we're uh, going to get started here in just a minute as soon as I can pull my phone back up. But, um, and I, again, I'm, you, you may recognize me. I'm, I'm the man behind the curtain here, so to speak. Uh, there's just the voice to Oz. And uh, anyways, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Hanna because Hanna's a great professional. She's, she's been working in this field for a number of years. Uh, actually, Hanna Burris has been, uh, she's been in the, uh, she spent the last 24 years implementing and facilitating a variety of the community outreach programs uh, that address stormwater pollute, polluted runoff. Uh, she currently works for the Jefferson County Commission in the Department of De Development Services, and her programs engage residents of all ages and encourage them to become involved in their communities to achieve cleaner waterways, which is very important. She serves as on the board of directors for the Alabama People Against um, against littered, the littered state, that's Al Alabama PALS, uh, AL PALS, as you probably call it, and the Alabama Water Watch Association. Uh, she is a master gardener, 2018, that's pretty cool, and received her certificate in native plant studies in 2019. She's an active gardener with a love of native plants. I've seen her yard, it's beautiful. <laughs> She's got some great things out there. Uh, she uh, uses her yard to uh, experiment with uh, uh, common uh, stormwater practices to uh, increase uh, infiltration and reduce the uh, stormwater runoff. She is always trying to new techniques to prevent the use of the uh, chemicals, and she currently has over 70 varieties of native plants in her yard and expands, uh, expands her collection annually. I've seen many of her pictures. I've been to her yard. It is absolutely beautiful, and she does a great job. So without further ado, here's Hannah Burris, and she's going to tell you about stormwater management with Jefferson County. Now have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Troy. Um, that was very sweet. And I wanted to let you all know I'm actually stepping in for a colleague, uh, Darikis Cooper who is the stormwater program manager for the city of Birmingham, wasn't able to uh, make the presentation. So I'm stepping in on his behalf. So thank you and welcome. First thing I wanted to do is I figure anytime we talk about water quality, why do we have it? Do we need regulations? How did the regulations start? Well, as the US became manufacturing home, Americans were exposed to more and more pollutants in both the air and the water. This was impacting the health of all Americans. An oil slick on the Chiyupoga River, I always mess that up, uh, caught fire on a Sunday morning in 1969 near the Republic Steel Mill. 
The mayor at the time was very concerned. His name was uh, Carl Stokes. He was really concerned about water quality and the impact it had to residents. Him and his brother, who was also a representative, um, started urging the federal government to do something about pollution control. This particular fire in this episode segued into what we would consider environmentalism now and also gave way and segue to the Clean Water Act of 1972. So I just wanted to give you a little history as to why it happened in the United States. Um, and, you know, industry, when industry came about, it was a common thought that, you know, this was just a byproduct. But when your river catches on fire, I think it, it took, um, I think people took heed and understood of the impacts. But it, that wasn't the first water quality um, law that we had in uh, the United States. The first one on the books was called the Federal Water Pollution Control Act of 1948. This was when Harry Truman was president. He wanted to make sure that um, discharges, that people intentionally discharging were going to require a permit. This law gets amended a few times. They say, okay, so we're going to implement these rules. We're gonna fix pollution, right? Because it's gotta be only from industry. That's what they thought. However, um, when we move up into Nixon's reign in uh, 1972, they realized, wait a minute, maybe we need to also uh, include and make sure that everybody who wants to have a national pollutant elimination discharge system permit needs to be regulated. Wait for it. Again, what happens a few years later is after they've reg made regulations, they've uh, asked industries and businesses to comply that have what's called point source. So in other words, if you um, have a manufacturing business and you are discharging a certain item uh, to the creek that you're gonna be permitted and you're gonna be constrained by the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, to fall within various limits that are set forth, right? So what happens though, is we're still having problems. And then 1987 comes around we start seeing the emergence of what we call non-point source pollution. So it's pollution that comes basically from people, you and me, and um, from various sources and called polluted runoff. So what happens based upon that 1987 rule, uh, every state in the United States was required to put together programs, uh, municipal separate storm sewer programs, also commonly called in our industry as an MS4, but it's just basically a big fancy word for water drainage system. So different cities and counties based upon the number of people that you have in a region and the volume of water or the number of creeks, lakes, lakes rivers, and streams you have in a region, we're then going to have to comply with what was going to be a phased in program. So here in Alabama, we're looking at uh, Alabama Congress uh, here, the State House. Um, they, through Alabama Department of Environmental Management, which is Alabama's environmental agency, required various people through the phase one. And again, remember this goes back in 1987. And it took a while for them, just because we were required, I say we, um, just because the states were required to put together programs in different cities doesn't mean that it happened overnight. There was uh, various implementation and, and strategies and figuring out what was going on. So in the state of Alabama, you can see all the different cities which would be considered, or counties, um, considered a phase one, again, a separate storm, a municipal separate storm sewer system entity. So here in Jefferson County, it was Jefferson County, Birmingham, and then 25 cities, um, Madison County, Huntsville, Mobile County, Mobile, Montgomery, and Shelby County were all part of the phase one permit programs. Now, you heard from Troy. Troy represents the city of Birmingham stormwater program. I'm with Jefferson County. Each of the stormwater programs carries their own independent permit, which is a, what we call a NEPTIS permit. Um, and ours, the National Pollutant Elimination Discharge System Permit, ALS 000001, 
um, got in place, they keep uh, renewing. And our current permit just for Jefferson County goes from October 2018 to September 30th of 2023. So each city and county gets their own permits. They are issued at various times and years uh, so that at least ADEM, Alabama Department of Environmental Management, wouldn't be overwhelmed and inundated with all these permits coming together at one time. And I wanted to list some of the things that we are required that actually falls in our NEPTIS phase one MS4 permit. Um, and the number two one says public education and public involvement. Uh, and anybody that knows Lynn and I handle this uh, part of the program, but the part of public education and public involvement also includes a lot of the other permit requirements such as um, fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, getting people to understand their connection, um, educating the staff within Jefferson County, and also doing um, pollution prevention, good housekeeping, and because that goes back to educating the staff, and also the oils, toxic hazardous waste, uh, stormwater control. Those are our hazardous waste programs, electronic uh, programs that we offer. So just because we do education doesn't mean that us giving the information out about the other permit requirements isn't, doesn't also fall under our realm. So just so that you know, it's not just Birmingham and Jefferson County. We have a lot of other agencies within Jefferson County that we collaborate with uh, that also are required to implement some type of stormwater program. Jefferson County Department of Health has a watershed division they implement on behalf of a conglomerate agency called Stormwater Management Authority, and they represent various cities that are listed below. But it doesn't really matter. The goal, okay, so we all have our own permits. We all have our own requirements. Some are a little different than others based upon size and, and that. But the ultimate goal, regardless of what permit you're, um, you're implementing or, or what city that you have to live within under what permit, the ultimate goal is the same, and that's protecting our waterways. We are trying to prevent pollutants from being washed and or dumped into our storm water system. Again, MS4, Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System. And the word separate is uh, important because we have a sister system, a sewer system, which is the sanitary sewer system. So when you flush your toilet or anything drains down pipes, that goes into a closed system to the wastewater treatment plant. The municipal separate storm sewer system is what goes to our rivers, our lakes, our creeks, our streams untreated. So have you ever thought about it? When it rains, you got an umbrella. The only thing you're worried about is a car. You know, if you're walking downtown Birmingham, maybe the only thing you're worried about is a car driving by, splashing water on you. But what we do, what we're trying to get a lot of more people paying attention and being cognizant and aware to is that when rain falls from the sky, it runs over different surfaces and it goes directly to our rivers, our lakes, our creeks, and our streams. And it's not treated. It, go, it is piped, it flows directly there. So it is a complex system. I have here what's called pervious. Pervious is an area like a rooftop, a driveway, cement. Uh, water cannot penetrate. And we need pervious areas, right? We want a rooftop that doesn't dribble water. We want roads that um, things can't go through, right? Um, however, this also comes at a cost. And th this description, I saw this infographic and maybe people, it might make a little more sense to you. Before we have development, Right, we have natural creeks and streams. They're curvy, they wiggle around, and these wiggle points, the curviness of a stream is very is actually important not only to support and maintain wildlife, um, but it also allows areas for when in the water rains, you've got uh, an area, a riparian area, flood zone for the water. Then all that rainwater to concentrate in, it fills up. Right, it expands like you see in the top middle picture. And then after the rain falls and the water either gets absorbed into the ground and or flows, and then the stream typically goes back to its normal, normal um, structure. 
when you look at the bottom, what we do is um, we got it. We we are interested in managing water, right? We don't like it in our basements. We don't want our streets to flood, and we also like development. We need to live around places. And here in Alabama, no matter where you live, you can walk, drive, bicycle uh, anywhere, and I guarantee you, within a quarter of a mile, you're going over a major. Uh, or a creek, um, a, a big tributary, an area in Thimble Stream, maybe that fills up with water and drains to our creek. Um, but we have a lot of water here. And again, what happens typically with development, and I'm not saying development's bad, um, but there are consequences, good, bad, and indifferent with development. So standard practices have been that we straight line the creek, right? We um, bulldoze around it, we build right up to it, uh, because who doesn't want to be along on the waterway, right? Great, great uh, property values. And then we build all these houses. And within these houses, we have rooftops, we have sidewalks, we have driveways, and all of these areas are what you consider impervious. So it's where water doesn't penetrate and allow to be soaked into the ground. When you concentrate a large volume of water that used to, prior to development, soak into the ground, we can lead to potential flooding. And with the higher rain events that we've had, the, um, our weather is, is changing. We're having more extreme weather events. So we're ending up with three inches of rain being dropped within a short amount of time. And even if we were in an undeveloped area that is still significant for this particular watershed area of land um, to handle, let alone if we have it mostly impervious surfaces, um, we're, we're only impacting the problem. This slide here shows a little bit a different view, and I'm going to show different views and, and bring about, I'll be talking about the same concept, but maybe bring it into a different light that you might not have thought about. But we have runoff from houses, right? And it goes into that um, little drain right there in the road. And then it's piped underneath different roads and it makes its way to a river, a creek, a lake, and a stream. Again, through the municipal separate storm sewer system. And with impervious areas, whatever is on the ground, that water is going to mix, combine, carry along with it to the nearest water body. And again, there is no treatment. It's not like wastewater treatment, like your flushable toilet water or your sink water where that gets treated. Um, this is openly piped to the nearest uh, waterway. This picture, sometimes people don't really make the connection. So I'm gonna point it out quickly for you. You've got the roof drain. Not everybody has roof drains, but the principle of that is it's coming off of your home. It goes down your street and enters water from other homes into a magical box. And, um, or sometimes you have open ditches. So different communities are, uh, have different structures in place, all put together by engineers. They have all these pipes combined together under roadways that you don't see. They fall, what we call an outfall. It's where the water, right, the runoff water falls out uh, into a waterway. And some could be small, like the pipe on the bottom left, or it could be a big pipe, like in the bottom middle. And it could even be even a bigger, so long as you might have large creeks coming together, entering its way to um, the nearest waterway. One of the biggest things that people don't, might not consider is what us in our industry call an illicit discharge. And illicit discharges are anything other than stormwater that's going to enter into this MS4 municipal separate storm sewer system. And again, our storm sewer system is designed, created so that it funnels water very quickly to prevent flooding off of roads um, to our waterway. It should only carry water. However, there are a few exceptions to the rule, and those would be landscape irrigation, dechlorinated swimming pool water, and water used in firefighting operations. Those are the only uh, sources of water other than rain that is permitted into the storm sewer system. And reporting what you see is the first step in us protecting and keeping our waterways clean. 
And we often say, this is not a magical place. This is not a place where you get to dump your used paint water. Um, and maybe if you're um, having a landscaping project on the, on the right side of the screen where you've got sediment and erosion happening in your, in your waterway, and in the bottom left is vehicle fluids. So regardless of what it is, again, these are considered in our industry an illicit discharge. So it's anything other than rainwater getting into our storm sewer system. Stormwater program staff, uh, industry, all monitor waterways. Water is a finite resource. We don't get to make any more. What we have is what we have, right? Through the uh, water cycle that we learned about in fourth grade. So we have rain goes um, and it falls down to the ground. And sometimes it filters into the ground infiltration and then the plants take it up, transfer evaporation, it gets into um, evaporation, right? And then condensation, and then it, it rains again. So within the earth surface, a lot of people might not, you know, pay attention to this again, but our earth surface, we have a lot of water, right? So if you look at earth from the, from the uh, moon, yes, it's a blue planet, right? But we do, have, um, we do have a significant amount of land as well. So 70% of earth is water, 30%-ish is land. However, all that water is not usable for us to drink. Um, it's mostly salt water. Out of all the water that we have within the planet earth, there's only about 1% that's available for us to use in agriculture, right? Where we get our food from, in businesses and industries where we like to manufacture items, um, and also as a drinking water source. So we need to be very mindful about what we do with that little 1% of all the water that we have on planet Earth. And I'm gonna go back to Environmental Protection Agency here in the United States. Again, we have the Environmental Protection Agency they um, set every waterway has a designated use, right? So whether it's fishable, whether it's bodily contact, whether it's for industry, and these uses determine what your water quality is going to be in those rivers, creeks, lakes, and streams. What we do in our stormwater program in the business industry um, what we do is we monitor to make sure that we are within, these waterways are within their set limits defined by EPA. And if, for example, we go out, we stormwater program staff, and we see that there is this um, water body is not meeting its designated, uh, designated uh, characteristics, we go out and we try to uh, find and eliminate the sources. Industries also, they, through their NEPTIS permit, um, again, going back into what they were required after the Clean Water Act in 1972, they also go and try to define and make sure that their discharges are within their set parameters and limits. And if they do exceed those, then they go back and see what's going on and they also correct and eliminate that as well. Um, I also wanted to take um, into consideration, okay, so the bottom right, and that's Eric with the Department of Health. And the top right, that is a bio blitz taking place at Turkey Creek. So not only do we look at chemical um, parameters, we also look at the wildlife. So we collect um, critters in the creek and look at them. Different critters have different tolerance levels with various pollutants. And so by looking and determining what the critters are, we can look and see what the overall water quality is. I wanted to bring to light though, the picture on the left is a young lady through the Alabama Water Watch Association. In Alabama, we have um, a volunteer water monitoring program. Uh, EPA has, a, uh, has approved the uh, quality assurance, quality control for the um, test that are performed. And if you are interested in being a volunteer and testing your local waterway, again, Alabama Water Watch is an agency where you can obtain that training. All right, water quality indicators. This is our friend Katie and uh, Wayne. We are at uh, Freshwater 
uh, freshwater land trust um, endangered species tour. We were looking at various fish in various creeks and what's shown here is the rush starter. And uh, basically what you can do is you can determine um, various water qualities by the chemical factors, right? So we can look at dissolved oxygen, temperature, turbidity, and these little cute little critters that we have here, the little rush starters, um, are only able to handle cool water that is uh, not really polluted at all. So by finding them, we know that this particular waterway that we were looking at uh, meet, probably meets its standards. We have to do chemical testing. But overall, just knowing that these little uh, cute little fish are living there is a good indicator of good water quality. And again, um, stream or surface water use classifications are established by the Water Quality Branch of Alabama Department of Environmental Management. You can look at these water quality standards on the Alabama uh, website, which is adem.state.al.us. And they also have a 303D listing, um, which are streams that are not meeting their standard water quality parameters. Those are updated every other year, and you could get those listed also from the, um, from the um, Alabama website. So, all right, we talked about why we have laws, we talked about monitoring and the need for it, but how exactly does our water get polluted? And does it matter? So industry, right, they're regulated, they're not polluting our waterways. Where exactly is all this pollution coming from? Coming from people like you and me, going about our everyday lives and what, uh, what actions we do or their lack of actions impacts our local water quality. Stormwater pollution, also called polluted runoff, kills wildlife. It degrades our water quality, drinking water. It smells bad and sometimes it looks terrible. Whatever it is, doesn't matter where it comes from. These are just four examples of what non-point source pollution um, can be. Um, it's the biggest threat to our local water quality. Comes from fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, from yards and gardens, oil and grease from roads and parking lots, heavy metals from roofs, eroded soil from construction sites, waste from pets, and litter, sadly, litter from people. Every little bit adds up to make a huge impact. I'm going to go over a few of them that are a little more detailed. And right here, vehicles. Well, the thing is, is we have more and more and more and more roads, right? So we like to get from point A to point B pretty quick. And we have impervious surfaces of roads. And before development, water again would uh, you know, filter into the ground uh, in undeveloped areas and vegetated areas. But since we've paved our areas asphalt, made them impervious, whatever sits on top of those surfaces is gonna get carried by rain to the local waterway. So things like vehicle fluids, motor oils, grease are all things that impact our local water quality. And sometimes people are like, it's only one drop. But if every vehicle in Jefferson County was to drop one drop of oil, we would pollute over 16 million gallons of water a day. So we try to tell people, fix and repair your vehicles. And uh, if you have a spill, clean it up quickly. Pet waste. Why are we gonna mess with baby little Fido? He's so cute, right? So why, what, wait, hold on. Pet waste, yes. The thing about pet waste is in a natural environment, there's nothing normal about the concentration of how many cute little Fidos that we have and a lot of them in more urban areas. Again, urban areas have concrete and um, impervious areas. So when we leave waste on the ground, chances are even to dry out, it's going to dry out and wash with rain and enter our lakes, our rivers, our creeks, our streams. The thing about pet waste, especially dogs, is that one pile, an average pile, contains about two and a half billion fecal coliform bacteria, as well as viruses and parasites. But again, having 150,000 uh, dogs living in an area the size of Jefferson County is not natural. And because of that, essentially those 150,000 
dogs are, pro, are creating about 38 tons, right? Tons of dog poop a day. So it's always important that you pick up, put it in the trash or bag it, pick it up, bag it, put it in the trash and do this also in your own backyard because again, all those bacterium you don't want just hanging around. People don't understand that we do have products. Products are important. They're very important, right? We like paint for our walls. We like chemicals to clean with. Um, however, what do we do with these items? Some people want to put them in the trash. Our landfills, our residential landfills are not equipped to handle these type of products. And some people want to pour them down that storm drain, that magical box on the side, because they need to get rid of them. Well, that's not a good method either. Jefferson County and surrounding uh, with Jefferson County Depart Jefferson County Commission in partnership with the Jefferson County Department of Health pay for hazardous waste day. I'm proud to say that we've just launched our new date for 2023, which um, is in April, uh, April 28th is the last, or 29th is the last weekend in April of 2023. There'll be three locations throughout Jefferson County, Irondale, Gardendale, and Bessemer. So be paying attention, look for our calendar, and we'll have more information on it. But that's the best way to dispose, properly dispose of these items. Litter. Oh, litter. Litter is the one thing that costs us nothing, right, to dispose of properly. We have household trash. We have trash cans in our parks. So whether you're in a public space, whether you're at home, whether you're at a gas station in vehicles, the last thing that we want you to do or that's appropriate is to toss anything out of the car. Litter costs a lot to clean up cities not just Jefferson County spend millions of dollars each year to pick up litter and we can't keep up with the litter bugs. And I'm not so sure why people want to litter. We're in a first world nation. We are more trashier than a third world nation because third world countries realize the importance of what litter does to their local waterways. They tend to keep it clean, but we have a lot of stuff, a lot of packaging materials being a first world country. And sadly, we don't always dispose of it correctly. So. We do have um, the different programs from water programs have come together. We have what's called Litter Quitters. It's a high school video competition. We target high school students, given that they're beginning to drive so that we can help offset this behavior before it even starts. And what I say is if you do litter, stop. Get other people to do the same. Tell your kids to stop littering. Tell them, let them know what the negative impact is. Again, it doesn't stay where it falls on the ground. It washes to the rivers, the creeks, the lakes, and the streams. So another thing, being with Jefferson County, we have uh, Jefferson County Environmental Services, which maintains the um, wastewater treatment plants here within Jefferson County. And one of the biggest issues that we have in Jefferson County and that um, environmental services has to deal with is what's called flushable wipes. I don't care what the ad says, these should never be flushed. They are not made out of materials that easily decompose like toilet paper. They're made out of polyester and plastics. And when flushed, if you do get it through your system, it's going to adhere and attach to the pipes, any imperfections that we have in the um, sanitary sewer pipe, they're going to, uh, to create backups. They also create something that's really gross called a fat bird, right? So these wipes along with oils and grease and all the other stuff that gets washed, flushed, you know, washed down drains and flushed down toilets, it combines and these big fat birds will end up into our sanitary sewer um, plants and it destroys uh, the equipment that we have in the plants, which is, is, is extremely costly uh, to fix. So what we ask is any type of white sanitary, um, whether it's you know, something that you're cleaning your counters with, or you're cleaning um, your infant baby, or for hygiene, I don't care. Never, ever, 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 never, never um, flush down the toilet. We ask that you put these in the trash, have a separate trash can if possible, 
Um, but again, never, ever, ever, never down the toilet. All right. When we talk about rainfall and we talk about the impervious areas of rainfall, what we're also in uh, Troy alluded to that a lot of cities are having problems with is the potential for flooding. And again, it goes back to developed areas. We have reduced the natural areas um, to where water can filter into the ground. We've made pervious areas where water is now concentrated and that creates a problem. Engineers in different cities are now looking at different programs so that we can mimic the natural function of mother nature in pre-development areas. I'm gonna show you some examples of what we would like to do and things to consider even at your home. Um, and that's one is keep all your trees that you possibly can when building a new home site. When you have the least amount of disturbance available, what you're doing is you're maintaining the integrity of the roots and the tree system, the canopy. So the leaves, when it rains, the canopy of the trees help stop the force of that raindrop, breaks down the velocity, right, the impact so that when it hits the ground, it's not going to create um, a, 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 a um, ability for that raindrop to hit the ground and break it apart, cre creating sedimentation and or erosion. And even on these hot days, we have had record heat around uh, Jefferson County. And the first place when we go outside is we look for tree for shade. So the more trees and more vegetated areas we have, we actually reduce what's called a heat island effect. And when you think about rain, when it washes on asphalt, concrete, in the hot heat of the summer, that water is heating up. That same water, again, does not get treated, does not get cooled before it enters our, um, our drainage system. And high temperatures impact the aquatic life, right? We don't need a fish fry in the creek uh, just because of the impervious areas. So at all times, trees um, in wooded areas are extremely beneficial, maintain them as much as possible. We also have um, in different organizations, right? Um, this is not just done at Bass Pro Shop, but we also try to highlight the industries and businesses that do stuff. You ever go there, shop there, you look at their parking lot, what they did when they built their facility, they tried to minimize as much uh, land as possible. They also terraced their areas um, so that it's not just one big sheet flow. And they put in what's called a bioswell, which is a vegetated area uh, typically right below a paved area where water can spread out, filter in, uh, get absorbed, slow the speed of that water, and it also helps reduce pollutants. So the pollution coming off of the vehicles and parking lots, right, that motor oil grease, sometimes even litter, gets caught up into these bioswells, um, which are really good. This is one impact also called low impact development or green infrastructure. It's a new key word. Um, I say new, it's been around about 10 years, but more people are jumping on the bandwagon and, and um, actually doing this stuff. You can do this stuff at home too. So, um, but that's in a different, uh, not just a biosphere, well, but I guess you could more like a rain garden on your home. Talk about stabilizing slopes. Not sure if you have a yard that's got steep areas where water concentrates. When you've got a steep area and water is concentrating your runoff, it's gonna speed up, right? So a lot of water going very fast, the velocity is gonna increase. When it increases, it's gonna go to the area of least resistance. So it's gonna go to an area when it comes to off of that slope, going to start creating gullies because that's a huge concentration of fast moving water, which isn't good. Here at Railroad Park, uh, we can see the use of what's called gabion walls, which are terrace. It's basically a form of terracing um, and retaining walls. And uh, gabion walls uses natural rock or stone in a caged format. Um, and basically what, it, what we're doing here is we're terracing. The, the walls actually act as uh, additional seating areas. Um, but when you go back in and you terrace an area and add uh, structures such as retaining walls, 
what you're doing is you're backfilling that wall area, allowing for more vegetation to grow, use of native plants like this pink muley grass, which is phenomenal in the fall, helps. And uh, again, these terraced areas allow for that storm water to act almost as speed bumps, that, that fast moving water gets caught, captured in this yummy, delicious soil behind that retaining wall, filters, you know, filters into the ground, it spreads it out. Um, and so you have less runoff coming on. Now for smaller slopes, um, there's other things that you can do, which is called uh, berms and swales. Basically you go back into that hillside, dig out a little trench, which would be a swale, a vegetated area, and the uh, material that you excavate out, you make it into a berm right below the swale, which is like a speed bump in essence. So it acts as the same thing. You're, you're trying to capture that rainwater, hold it into an area so that it can a, slow that velocity down, slow the speed, hopefully get it to absorb into the soil um, so that you've got less of an impact as it makes its way to the bottom of the property. And this also, remember, helps reduce erosion and sedimentation. So mud, earth, dirt, silt, soil, rock, uh, also impacting our waterways because it settles out in our waterways and also, when you fill in your waterways with with the soil and dirt earth rock where's your water going to go right so it can also help reduce uh, the impact of um, potential flooding we have uh, another thing you can say oh well those are just pavers okay I got that these are permeable pavers um, and you can use rock stone um, use in high traffic areas at your home but what this does is it helps slow that water down coming off of a vegetated area and or parking lot. All those little um, bricks help, like I said, act as tiny little speed bumps and water gets absorbed underneath these, uh, this area permeable pavers is actually constructed soils and different materials um, that will help uh, hold that water. So it's acting more like a natural, un uh, developed area. So we get more water absorbed into the ground. The more we get absorbed in the ground, the less comes um, to our local waterways. And it's not just permeable paper. So anything permeable, remember, allows water to soak. Uh, Botanical Gardens has permeable asphalt. Um, and there's also concrete these days. There's plastic grid pavers, paver stones, and pebbles. So there's multiple use um, and materials that you can use for the same concept. And again, what we're going to talk about is stormwater landscaping, right? You can landscape your, I have in my yard, um, but anybody, doesn't matter your place of business, big or small business, and your home, you can landscape it so that you're going to have a, a reduction in erosion sedimentation so that you're gonna capture most water that you can, the use of native plants so that you rely less on for, and there's a place for ornamentals. Look, I love my camellias, right? Um, but camellias are not native. Uh, well, there is one that is native, but most that we see are the japonicas um, that are not native. However, um, and they require a little more attention, ornamentals uh, more so than natives. And our native plants are used to our heat. They're used to uh, sometimes drought and they're also good for our wildlife. Here is actually uh, the Stuart Perry. If y'all aren't familiar with them, they are phenomenal. They uh, have their facility on an area that they wanted to not disturb so much. They were mindful in building it, reclaimed a lot of the materials um, and high walkways. They have things such as this um, the, a walkway of stone so that you're not banging into the, the ground, eroding it. Um, and so if you haven't ever gone out to see what they've got, it's pretty impressive. Um, and they are leaders in the industry. So um, we're appreciative that they let us use um, this picture um, and also to talk about what really cool stuff that they're doing. They harvest rainwater, they do all kinds of stuff. All right, so um, Troy mentioned that he's been to my house and uh, I have a lovely neighbor. Um, she's not in the gardening as much as I am. I I'm, I'm, uh, was a stormwater person that bought the house on the low side of the street where all that rainwater comes. This is just a picture of 
what happens when we have a massive rainfall. You can see my neighbor's property on the left, what her ground looks like. And what I've done on the property on my right, coming off of a driveway, I've funnel channeled my rainwater into what you would consider a rain garden in the area where I can capture, hold, store rain. Um, and it doesn't flow off as much. You can see that I do get a, a large volume of water coming from the bricks channeling it. And then it, where does it go? It's in the ground. Um, I do have the wall uh, in the middle so that you can kind of see uh, what's going on between our two properties, how I'm heavily vegetated and how my neighbors isn't and uh, see the impact of what. This is the side view of my neighbor's house. You can see with a yellow circle that I've got a lot of rain coming off. You see what has happened on the downspouts of her roof and gutters. It's eroded the soil, that water just flows off her roof, goes on to what little grass she had is now bare and barren, right? And so that's causing more erosion and more ruts in her yard versus mine um what you see in the green which is heavily vegetated area my composting my leaves i have sand there i've added uh amendments to my soil so that i could get nice yummy spongy soil there this is a shade area so there's plants that you could use for the shade and or the sun but here um, is mostly shade you could tell by the ferns uh, viburnum and stuff so what you do on your property impacts your runoff. I just thought this was a good example uh, to bring it home. A lot of people say, well, what, hold on, what, how does this impact me? The other thing, again, let's talk about trying to detain as much water as possible, right? Um, and that also goes back, if you think about um, Laverne going back, I'm detaining my water. She's got a lot of run off. If all the houses look like my neighbors, we're gonna have a bigger impact to our storm sewer system. The more we can hold um, and mimic mother nature and low impact development, green infrastructure, the better off our plants are. I'm able to capture, add more back to rainwater, right? And my yard, even though I have a lot of plants, you're like, oh, the water bill, whatever. I've amended my soil and made it uh, an actual ecosystem to where my dirt stays wetter than my neighbor's does. When we've had these epic temperatures, I've actually had moisture in my soil versus I know at my neighbor's house, it was dry, crunchy, the ground was cracking. So um, it does matter. So detain, detain, detain. And why is that important? Again, when we developed our areas, our cities, our towns, our municipalities, the goal was to get that water off the street as possible to reduce flooding. And we've built more and more and more, right? More population, more people want to live in more urban areas. Rural areas are getting turned into concrete, asphalt, rooftops, which is fine. We have more people, we need places to live, but it comes as an impact to our municipal separate storm sewer system, right? That MS4. So what we're trying to do and what you'll notice if you're doing um, construction on new houses and or redevelopment of areas, um, there's going to be different practices that we want you to put in place. Um, and even the cities, municipalities are doing it themselves when it comes to roadways and um, pervious areas. Again, the whole point is to let's remove and try to reduce as much flash flooding as possible. No, Birmingham's gotten a big hit about it lately. They've been working for years that y'all might not know on greenways, um, trying to reclaim some of the area, build it back up like I did in my backyard so that water um, that used to flood off of an area wash um, is now being more contained. Um, but one thing that you can do is just capture it, capture it quickly. The top left is a cistern that's at Turkey Creek Nature Preserve. They just built a new pavilion. If you haven't been out there, go visit. You can rent it out. It's a beautiful place. It's about 1,200 gallon capacity. And what they use for that rainwater is they use it um, to rewater their landscaping, which is mostly native. Just because you have native plants doesn't mean they don't require water. But what they're able to do is hold it, capture it, and use it when it's not raining to get it to filter into the ground. You can do rain barrel 
a rain barrel at home, you could do two. There's a lot of water that comes off our roofs. This water can be reapplied to your landscape. Rainwater is different than public use water. Rainwater actually has a little bit of nitrogen in it um, that's captured and sequestered as it, as it falls from the atmosphere. It doesn't have chlorine. So um, be very mindful and you too can capture your own rainwater. I do at my house um, and I keep wanting to add more and more um, because it's a vital resource. It's not just Turkey Creek Nature Preserve. Other people do it. Stuart Perry, as I talked before, does it. Here at the zoo, at the bottom right-hand corner is at Birmingham uh, Zoo. They harvest their rainwater. They reuse it for their um, irrigation system. And it's important they um, are mindful about what they do and their footprint. Um, so we're pleased to know that uh, capturing and harvesting their rainwater is just as important at their uh, facilities than it is at home. I talked before about rain gardens. Rain gardens are pretty awesome. I have a few rain gardens I've installed on my property. Again, I'm at the low spot trying to capture that water. I'm trying to capture water at the top of my yard, in the middle of my yard, and at the bottom of my yard, uh, trying to not only hold it for my vegetation, but also reduce my footprint. My backyard used to flood. I get very little flooding these days. Um, and one means is this neat little depression that you can add to your, to your property called a rain garden. Um, it, they're basically, um, the best use for them is below impervious surfaces like driveways, walkways. Uh, the main goal is for that water to capture, hold it try to get it to absorb into the ground, just like it would in mimic mother nature prior to development. Um, it uh, allows for an opportunity, if you're a plant lover like me, it's like, oh my goodness, I get another area where I can plant more plants, right? Um, you use water loving plants down in the bottom where it's gonna hold water. Uh, it doesn't hold mosquitoes. Again, if you build it correctly, it shouldn't maintain and hold water like a pond. It will slowly filter back in. Mine goes about 24 hours after a huge rain event and then it's dry again. Uh, the plants that you choose, again, native, so it supports wildlife. Um, and also some of the plants that you're gonna choose can also handle extreme droughts, right? Cause these are extreme situations, all water or no water. So, um, and we can help you with plant choices uh, with those, but typical things are cone flowers, gorgeous asters for the fall, American beauty berry. Oh, it gives great fall color. These fun little purple berries um, and some have white wax myrtles. I've got a few of those great evergreen. Um, and bee balm, oh my gosh, Minardo, it, there's like, I don't know, 10 different varieties. And also what's called a hummingbird mint plant. So <laughs> hummingbirds, right? So they're also wildlife. Here at Birmingham, uh, Birmingham Southern College, um, they have what's called a settling pond. Settling ponds are large scale rain gardens. As you see in this picture, it's got vegetation. And when in this particular instance, when the rain gets, um, when, when this area fills up, it's got an overflow that's going to go into their retention pond, which holds water all the time. And the goal of this, um, it's um, was put in um, from some of the pervious areas um, for the United Methodist Church, North Alabama Conference Center and their parking lot. So when they built it, they were making more impervious areas. They were trying to mitigate that to help um, control uh, uh, rainwater um, going into nearby Valley Creek, which was also already um, um, susceptible to um, flooding, right? The Valley Creek starts at the toes of Vulcan, goes all the way through Southside and downtown Birmingham. And so, um, Birmingham Southern College said, we're gonna help reduce our water footprint um, and installed something really cool as a settling pond. Uh, and the whole goal of this rain gardens and stuff, and since COVID, we all heard flatten the curve, flatten the curve, right? The whole goal of these impact, low impact developments do the same thing. We're trying to flatten that curve so we have less spike in rainfall, that less speed stops the, um, 
undermining of the creek banks. So erosion helps um, so many, so many different things. Um, where with the botanical gardens, um, they are pretty fabulous. Not do they have a wonderful collection. They're also mindful about their footprint. Uh, this right here, if you've ever been to the botanical gardens, you drive in their entrance. This is on the left. It's picturesque, perfect for photographs, or if you just want to sit with a book. Oh my gosh, it's wonderful. It's vegetated by native plants. Um, the water feature in the center is to help add oxygen into the water, but uh, this is basically a detention pond that they have. They revamped, redid um, the entrance to the um, botanical gardens in the latter part of 1980. This area was um, holding water anyway. They wanted to help mitigate that, make sure that you know the front entrance was dry. They um, installed this. The plans were to reuse this water in applications of irrigation. But what they're doing is they're being mindful, holding that water back so that it um, reduces the potential of flooding downstream in Griffith Creek, which goes to Shades Creek. Um, and not only is it just pretty, right? Serene to look at. They also, if you go into the gardens, they have another cool area. This is the Barber Alabama Woodlands. This is an area called a riparian area or what you might even consider a flood zone. It was intentional. What they do is they built this area so that when it rained, this water would, um, this area would hold the water. It acts as a border between the land and a river and a stream, right? So it's, it's making sure that the water has a, some place to go so that you reduce the volume to that, that creek. Um, and not only that, you, you get to have all different type of plants for this area. Cities are going back to putting back in their riparian areas, their floodplains. If you go on um, Shades Creek Greenway, right, Jemison Park through Homewood, they're building back their floodplain areas, areas meant to hold water to flood so that you're going to reduce the impact of all that rainwater into a system. Um, hopefully, and actually helping uh, the potential for flooding downstream. So hats off to Birmingham Botanical Gardens. Not only are they a forerunner with uh, the plants um, that they have, they're also, they walk the walk, right, that they talk. And they're trying to be mindful in their footprint about water, water management, um, and what they do. So we're real proud to, to showcase them as well. Um, all right retaining water. So we've talked about how do we hold it? How do we capture? Right now, what are we going to do to retain the water? There are some things um, that you, you can see, and the obvious would be make a big lake. Um, sometimes in big developments, you see that. They're like, oh, the development, how cool they gave us a lake. Well, it's actually the retention pond um, that they've amplified and made pretty, which is a good thing. Um, but there's other ways and the reasons, again, why we want to hold it, slow it, let it soak in. The Auburn campus, we'll say roll tide, go Clemson on Auburn. Um, they have a really neat bioretention area. Um, Keith Ron, who is a professor down there, shared this photo with me. Not only is it beautiful, right, as a plant lover, <laughs> right, you get to have some kind of aesthetic. But this actually serves a huge purpose, right? So um, it allows and captures rainwater from impervious surfaces and also captures pollutants, allows those pollutants to then filter out. Um, and we're talking, uh, you know, sedimentation, we're talking um, vehicle fluids, oil and grease, um, pet waste, yard chemicals. Um, and it is engineered, right? So it was dug out. There's different soils and substrates put in on purpose to hold that water, allow it to filter in. The plants act as phytoremediation, right? They help take up some of the water and release it through transpiration. Trans transpiration. Um, so it's not only does it look good, but it's actually a benefit to uh, the campus down there and also to lowering their impact of the rainwater um, runoff and pollutants, right? Non-point source pollution, um, but it's helping mitigate 
potential flooding, and it's also collecting, capturing a lot of the non-point source pollutants um, that happen, again, from you know, a large amount of people in a small amount of area. Um, let's see here. This is very similar to a rain garden, um, except this has a higher potential to retain more, whereas a rain garden, right, it's only going to retain for a little bit. But um, the same kind of principle is used as we do on home rain gardens. And one of the last, this is also at Birmingham Southern College. It's a different angle. We saw the um, settling pond or the, rain, the large scale rain garden a few minutes ago. This is a huge pond that they have. It is specifically to hold back and retain their rainwater. It looks great. It provides walking paths, right, for people. It's an outdoor recreation area. You can see in the back area when this pond fills up, uh, there's an overflow so that this rainwater will flow into Valley Creek, but it doesn't flow all at once. It's a little trickle, right? Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty awesome. Uh, again, you see these on large scale commercial sites, sometimes in large scale subdivisions. Um, and the best part about it is to be surrounded by native vegetation, which allows more wildlife corridors, right? So that we've got uh, for our pollinators and for our birds and um, things such as that. Um, and using in the use of natural uh, vegetation that would naturally be in these particular areas is also a benefit, um, helps hold back the soil around the pond. So um, this is one of the pretty obvious things, but again, it has a use and it has a purpose, not just an area for recreation and to look pretty. It's actually helping slow the flow of water, capturing it. So um, again, possibly to uh, reduce the potential for flooding downstream. And with that, I am done. So if we have any questions, I'll be happy to take them now. We have a comment and a question. Okay. Um, so before Mark got off, he said that he was he might not be able to stay for the whole time. Um, but the comment is, it is important to me to dispose of household hazardous chemicals responsibly. I'm glad there will be a way to do this in April 2023. However, we need a place where we can go every day to dispose of them properly. Asking citizens to wait once a year incentivizes people to dispose of them incorrectly. As a community, we need to make it as easy as possible. This is my hope for the future. And so he's not wrong. Um, it, these events cost a lot of money to put on. They're average about $150,000 for that one day event. Um, and what I say to y'all is contact your uh, elected officials, let them know that opportunities, um, that you need more opportunities because that's, that's who funds our programs. We're very excited that we have them when um, the county um, and everybody else had recessions a few years ago, they weren't, again, because of the enormity of the cost for this. Um, so pay attention, like I said, get um, pay attention, attend your uh, local city council commission meetings, let them know that this is important um, and it's something that you wish they would fund more often. And I understand um, when my mama passed away, we had all this stuff. She, you know, I had to hold on to it so that I could do it responsibly. So I absolutely concur. And we do have some ways locally where people can dispose of some things that y'all take um, on those days. Like y'all do weekly pickup of grease, right? In certain locations. <sighs> Well, I'm glad you even brought that. Yeah, so Household Oil and Grease, there are 20 different locations throughout Jefferson County that you can dispose of. Botanical Gardens is one of the um, locations. You can reach out to me, I can send you a list, or you go to jccal.org slash es, environmental services. Um, and we also, on to that note, electronics are a huge issue. Jefferson County Commission, along with other stormwater programs and local um, industries, fund three or four additional um, 
mostly four, but sometimes we can only squeak out three um, different events. They're typically held in January, February at the Birmingham Zoo. We hold one in um, May at Centerpoint in Bessemer in June, and then October downtown courthouse uh, or downtown city hall, city Birmingham. Um, and electronics and e-waste is vital uh, to dispose of. And if y'all reach out to us, there are other means. Um, Home Depot and Lowe's do uh, light bulbs. So there's other avenues and possible opportunities. If you have spare yard chemicals with the Master Gardener programs, there might be somebody else that might need to um, utilize these. So please, by any means, reach out uh, to me, Lynn. We will be happy to contact other people as well. So while we only have it one time a year, it, it is aggravating. But there are opportunities for other um, for other items to be disposed of throughout the year. I appreciate you bringing that up. And I know our grocery stores um, have been really good about providing places for people to recycle. Now I think Target takes glass. Yes. And Publix has um, their boxes right outside where you can recycle your plastic bags, paper, and some other things. So if you're Correct. looking for places, just contact them and they can direct you in the best way to go. But those are some of the places that I've seen. Um, we had a question from Jennifer earlier, Jennifer Sanders. Do you know of any local source resources for doing more porous or other greener forms of driveways? Oh. Um, hey, Jennifer, <laughs> by the way, um, there are, uh, there's different vendors that do stuff around locally. There's pebbles, you know, a lot of people do that Selma Brown pebbles, um, and it depends on your jurisdiction. So, um, Jennifer, you know who I am, reach out to me and I'll be able to give you a little more information or anybody. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be her reach out to us. It depends on your jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. um, it depends on um, sometimes if you're like Mountain Brook, you're only allowed to have so much impervious surface. So you have to increase um, your pervious surfaces and you can do that by different means and it's regulated or uh, the different techniques are available from different jurisdictions. So there are, um, and not that I don't wanna you know, provide them, but it just, it, there's a, sometimes it's a little dependent on where you live and the jurisdiction that you live in, but we'll be happy to get you to where you need to go and provide you the different uh, techniques and practices in place for that. Yeah, and I know with City of Birmingham, you have to get approved for a, um, a stone driveway. I have a stone driveway at my house and I know that when I get it redone, I'm probably gonna have to go down to City Hall and talk to them about it. We had a comment from Maggie. Do local municipalities offer any kind of incentives preference to builders to incorporate permeable sur surfaces into plans for new subdivisions, driveways, patios, et cetera? Um, that's gonna be municipality dependent. I'm not sure um, what programs they have. I know in other cities around in the Southeast, they, they have, uh, they've been doing it a lot longer than we have and have incentivized programs. But my recommendation is call your local jurisdiction where you're building, ask them if they have any incentives, talk to them. There's um, different handbooks that you can uh, look to, um, to identify the different sources and different products out there. So that's where I would start is, is contact your um, building and permitting and stormwater um, like uh, uh, staff hey, Hannah. within the jurisdiction. Yes, yeah, Hannah, this is Troy. Uh, yeah, uh, the city of Birmingham requires that. Uh, what they do is they require that any stormwater runoff uh, should be either put into some type of uh, retention, detention, or they have to show, and usually when they develop a subdivision, they will require certain uh, things to put in place to mean that the runoff is not increased to neighboring properties, that, that there is a certain requirements uh, that they have to retain the stormwater on, on these developments as they develop, and that includes commercial properties. So uh, that's usually done in the engineering phase, and uh, there's a post-ordinance uh, construction that uh, is put in place for the city of Birmingham that requires all those things. So yeah, there are incentives, but there, it actually is part of the law. It's part of the requirements. So uh, it's not necessarily an incentive. It's just what they required to do. Okay. 
I'm glad you brought that up, Troy, because yes, it's um, post-construction um, redevelopment uh, ordinances. I know in Jefferson County, it's Article 14. Um, I do believe all stormwater uh, entities within Jefferson County have something of such. So yeah, I'm glad you brought it yeah, It is a requirement, but I'm not sure if it, even though it's a requirement, if you do certain things, um, whether they would incentivize one or the other, but I'm glad you brought that up. Um, Michelle asked in Q&A, in Birmingham recently, we've, we've experienced a lot of rain and downpours and only once in a while. But if you were to have rain barrels for water from your roof, what would happen after the rain barrel fills? As someone who is interested in adopting rain barrels, it seems they will quickly in a downpour. Um, so rain, there's, uh, I use Fisker's Diverter Pro, and actually we have an annual rain barrel workshop here in Jefferson County. Um, it has typically been held at the Botanical Gardens. We're going to move that for 2023. If you reach out to me, I'll be happy to uh, give you the date and, and, and location for that. Um, but there are, when you install rain barrels, um, within your downspout or gutter, there's a an, uh, product called divert, um, Fisker's Diverter, and you attach it um, within your uh, rain spout system, right, in your downspout gutter system. So the barrels fill up, and then as soon as the barrels fill up, and even if you have multiple barrels, it'll fill them up first, and then the, the rest of the runoff will go into um, the downspout where it, where it went in the beginning. So, and I reuse mine for watering. I have a lot of, I have a lot of plants, um, but I use it for my container plants and also my indoor house plants. Um, and again, you know, just reusing that water when it's not raining is a benefit to the overall storm water system and the volume of water that we have. Um, Leah or Lee asked if there are any resources for building a rain garden in the shade. Um, yes, there are, um, there, um, my email address is here. There's the Alabama Watershed Stewards, which is, um, a program at Auburn University through the Alabama Cooperative Extension System. They have workshops. One of them is how to build a rain garden and, uh, the, the staff that are within this program are very knowledge on the different vegetation and can provide, whether it's shade and or sun, um, they'll provide you appropriate vegetation for your rain garden and how to construct it. So, nice. yeah. Um, Kathy or in the chat. She's a doll. Kathy in the chat asks, can drainage ditches be cleaned out? Ours is clogged and the water makes a new path across our yard. Um, drainage ditch, so I'm not sure, I assume this might be the municipal ditch in front of their yard um, that goes underneath their driveway. Is that might be what she's referring to? Um, and if that's the case, you want to yeah. make sure Let's, any type of open ditch. Yeah, Troy? Yeah, I just want to mention that uh, we do have a 311 if you're in the city of Birmingham. Uh, the uh, they do uh, clean out ditches from time to time. Uh, we have to, you know, take a look at it. Uh, the number one priority with the city of Birmingham right now is obviously the flooding and, and hazard to life and property. Uh, those are the priorities. But if things develop and the city is freed up with more resources, uh, we may be able to clean out some ditches that are just causing a flooding problem. If the flooding problem reaches any property, like in a house or something, and it's causing flooding into your property, then call 311 if you're in the city of Birmingham and report that, and they will be able to uh, send people out, but make sure you tell them it's flooding. And I'm talking about going into your home. You know, if it floods in your yard, that's one thing. But when it's going into somebody's home, they're more apt to uh, get to it in a more quicker situation. So that, that's the best way to handle that. That is if you're in the city limits of Birmingham, but other municipalities and other areas around the county should have the same type of system. Just find out what local uh, jurisdiction you're in and use their resources to see if you can get some of those ditches cleaned out, especially if it's in an easement. Now, if it's on private property, the city is less likely to get to it anytime soon. They can't, that We've seen issues before where people put in drainage ditches, but it's on private property. That's up for them to uh, maintain those ditches. 
So, and to what Troy was saying to that point, like the county also does stuff, but um, there's a sweet spot, whether it's on your property or whether it's on an easement and the county can get to it. Um, so even within Jefferson County, if you touch base with me, we have Camp Ketona and Camp Bessemer that handle those things. Um, but the big thing for jurisdiction to do is they can't go on private property and not all ditches just because it's a ditch on your property would be considered um, county easement versus private. So, um, but yeah, maintain, keep it as clean as possible. Again, that is to funnel rainwater from the street and get it to the uh, waterway as quick as possible. Uh, Michelle asks, what are recommended ways to make a rain barrel match your property if your HOA requires it? Um, I would say like match your property, I would say maybe like the color scheme of it. So if it's brick, um, rain barrels can be painted, right? So, um, and they can come in different sizes and structures. Um, so we typically get the 55 gallon olive barrels um, that are terracotta, but there are some that are gray, uh, but these barrels can be painted, right? Um, so I would just talk to them and see if you can paint it the same as your exterior house color or something close to that um, would be good. The other thing that you might be able to do is tuck up that rain barrel um, behind some vegetation. So maybe extend your flower bed out um, on the side of your house or whatever, and then uh, you can extend your vegetation out in front of it so that it's less visible from the street. So there are means and methods that you can do um, to, to adhere to the HOA's policies, but still get what you need done. Okay. And Brenda, this recording will be available later. I'm gonna be working on that tomorrow. Um, and also for Maggie, who joined us late, the recording will be available for you later. You're going to get an email from me um, with this, also a copy of the presentation and any other resources that we have for you all. Um, but also it'll be provided to the public on our YouTube page when that email goes out to you all. Michelle has one more question on our Q&A and she asks, are there any things you should watch out if you are going to make a depression in your yard for a rain garden? For example, oh, yeah. <laughs> our half acre property is forest, no grass. Is there anything I might end up doing worse by my landscape by making a depression? <laughs> Everything that you do, good, bad, and indifferent, is going to have an alternate consequence, right? So um, I would uh, call 311. Or no, uh, 911. Uh, call before you dig. I can't remember what that number is. But when you start making depressions and digging in any of your yard, make sure that you locate your utilities and all that. In Alabama, call before you dig does it for free. Um, so call them and uh, outline the area. Um, depends on, um, you always want to make sure that your rain gardens are at least 50 feet away from a structure. Um, and depending on the volume of water that you're collecting, depends on the size of the rain garden and just making a depression in your yard. Rain gardens have different layers um, that's needed so that the water can filter down quickly. Um, and part of that, there's, there's a um, pamphlet and a brochure that Extension has on rain gardens and also the um, watershed stewards also has information on it. So you first want to dig a hole and fill it up with water and see how long it takes for that water to percolate through your soil. We have a lot of clay soils here in Alabama that doesn't want to hold water uh, or that wants to hold water and not allow water to percolate through. So, um, so yes, I would say call, uh, call before you dig first. Uh, reach out to me. Let me get you in contact with the extension people that do this every day and let's get you some more literature um, so that you can read up on it a little more. And call before you dig is 811.